So learning unit four is on protein function. So we've learned a lot about how we can create protein structure, but we take one specific example with oxygen transport and we learn about how proteins function. And so starting out this chapter, we just learn about one class of proteins that are called globins. So globins are oxygen binding proteins. We're specifically going to be talking about hemoglobin and myoglobin. So again, I want you to know that hemoglobin is the oxygen binding protein that's free in the blood. Myoglobin is the oxygen binding protein that's found in tissues. And as we'll see on the next few slides, hemoglobin is going to be a tetramer. Myoglobin is going to be a monomer. So some terminology that we have here. When we see a protein that is without its ligand, we refer to that as an apoprotein. A holoprotein has a protein with its ligand. And when we think about the ligand sandwich that we have specifically for hemoglobin and myoglobin, we can begin by thinking about having a protein here that binds its heme ligand. That heme ligand binds its iron ligand. And then that iron ligand is what we refer to as hexacoordinate, meaning it binds six different ligands or six different components. So four of the components are the nitrogen atoms that are contained within the heme ring. A fifth ligand is a critical histidine that's found on the globin. In this case, it's from myoglobin. And then the sixth ligand is the reversible uh, ligand, reversible binding ligand, oxygen. And so again, this is where we have other ligands that can potentially come in and be problematic for uh, uh, hemoglobin or myoglobin, for example, having carbon monoxide come in is going to be problematic because it binds 200 times as tightly. We'll get to that on the next slide. So an important concept to think about with particularly globins or oxygen binding proteins are two terms that sound similar but they're very different, oxidation and oxygenation. So oxidation, like we learned in general chemistry, is really the loss of electrons. And we're talking about specifically the loss of electrons in iron. So this is the chemistry that we have here to generate ferric or iron three plus iron rather than the ferrous or iron two plus. So again, this is problematic because when iron is in this ferric state, it's not able to bind oxygen. And when it can't bind oxygen, it can't perform its function. And so oxidation here is what creates the brown color in oxidized uh, meat and in dried blood. And we refer to these components as either met myoglobin if the iron in myoglobin has been oxidized, or met hemoglobin if it's the iron in hemoglobin that's been oxidized. The desirable situation is oxygenation, which has to do with the reversible binding of oxygen to that iron ligand that's bound within the heme. So again, we'll show this very simply with oxygen binding here, myoglobin in this case binding oxygen to create a complex, a myoglobin oxygen complex. We'll expand more on this uh, equation in a couple of slides. But when we think about hemoglobin, again, being uh, a transporter of oxygen in the blood, when it's deoxygenated, that is, it's delivered its oxygen, it's returning back to the lungs and the heart via the venous system. And the color of deoxyhemoglobin is purple because of this. Once it becomes oxyge oxygenated in the lungs, it becomes oxyhemoglobin, which is bright red in color. And then the arteries take this away from the heart and the lungs to deliver that oxygen to the rest of the tissues. Again, another undesirable situation here is when a ligand that's not oxygen binds. And because carbon monoxide binds 200 times more tightly than oxygen, it's not doing chemistry like we see here where we're oxidizing iron and changing uh, the ability of that hemoglobin or myoglobin to be functional. Rather, we're just binding a ligand here that doesn't come off. And that really re results in suffocation from the inside out because you can't get oxygen to, deliver, to be delivered to your tissues. And so a couple of um, stories that we talked about and that may be expanded on in um, a take-home question has to do with the fact that fetal hemoglobin actually has a greater affinity for oxygen than maternal hemoglobin. And similarly, then it's gonna have a greater affinity for carbon monoxide, and that's problematic. But a real-life application is the actual use of carbon monoxide to keep meat red. So again, when you keep carbon monoxide bound in that uh, ligand, you can't bind um, oxygen there. And when oxygen is not constantly sitting close to that iron, you don't have this oxidation effect. So we're gonna expand on this equation in, in a few more slides, but again, remember our basic fuel equation. Fuel um, 
Combined with oxygen, this is again metabolism, generates carbon dioxide as a waste product, water, and then energy, and that energy gets delivered to the respiring tissues. So we kind of started out our biochemistry journey thinking about this equation, but we really haven't thought about the fact that we are a multicellular organism where we are picking up oxygen in our lungs and our respiring tissues are static. And so we need to think about a way to sort of deliver this. And so we thought about it in terms of sort of this bucket brigade, where we can think about these men here serving like the mobile hemoglobin that we have, oxygen really being like the water that we pick up at the wells, and the respiring tissues really being uh, where we're having this fuel metabolism happen. And so myoglobin is going to be able to pick up that oxygen and deliver it to those respiring tissues. We're going to expand a little bit further too as well on this carbon dioxide that's produced. It's a waste product that needs to be eliminated and we're going to see our old friend carbonic anhydrase come into play here. And importantly, we're going to learn that this equilibrium has an important component to carbonic anhydrase activity in this process in particular, and that it changes the equilibrium direction depending on whether it's in the lungs or the tissues. So we spent a little bit of time thinking about some math. There's not too much that you're going to need to think about doing here, but I do want you to be able to write a general binding equation. So again, we have myoglobin in this case binding its oxygen ligand to generate a complex here. In writing a KD value, normally when we write equilibrium constants, you'd think about writing products over reactants. But when we're writing dissociation constants, we're really thinking about this reaction operating in the reverse direction. That is the complex dissociating into its free sort of component and ligand. So when we think about this reaction going in this direction, whereas these are the products, the dissociation constant still is written as we typically write equilibrium constants, products over reactants. So being able to write an equilibrium um, KD value is going to become an important skill for your test. We went into a little bit of math to think about how we get to an equation that allows us to plot a hyperbolic curve. So again, since we're talking specifically about this situation, the concentration of ligand is measured as partial pressures. So when we're talking about concentrations of gases, yes, you can express them in terms of millimolar or so forth. But usually with gases, we think about them in terms of partial pressures. So when we're talking about myoglobin, myoglobin exhibits what we call non-cooperative binding. And that makes sense. It's only a monomeric uh, protein. It doesn't have other partners that could cooperate with. So when we see non-cooperative binding, that's exhibited by what we call hyperbolic binding curve. So a curve that kind of looks like this, like a hyperbola. So we started thinking about binding curves by showing this simple system with myoglobin. And a couple of important points to kind of highlight with this slide. We've seen that halfway values have a lot of value in biochemistry. And again, we talked about them with protonation state relating a property of the environment as, PK, as pH with a uh, molecular property like pKa. We thought about it in terms of proteins where we'd have a property of the environment like pH relating to a property of the molecule like pI. So in the same way here, we're going to think about two properties. One, a property of the environment, which is the ligand concentration. And so for our system here, we're referring to the ligand concentration as the concentration of oxygen measured as partial pressures. And then the property of the molecule has to do with the KD value, which in this situation we're calling P50. So if we were to define P50, we could say that it's the PO2 to be at for half of our myoglobin molecules to bind oxygen. So much like we defined pKa as the pH you needed to be at for half of your molecules to be protonated, we defined pI as the pH you need to be at for your protein to have no net charge. We can define P50 as the PO2 you need to be at for half of your molecules, in this case myoglobin, to bind to oxygen. So again, we can see here that this value represents that P50 value. Again, you can think of this in terms of and uh, a dissociation constant as well. So then we moved on to study hemoglobin. And there's a lot of parallels to hemoglobin structure compared to myoglobin structure. They look very similar. They're eight alpha helices. But what's really interesting is the fact that only 18% of that sequence is conserved. Not a number you need to remember, but it's an important concept that highlights that nature conserves structure 
which again allows us to be afforded function. Nature doesn't necessarily conserve sequence unless there's a specific amino acid that's really important for activity. So hemoglobin again is a tetramer and there are two alpha protomers and two beta protomers that associate to make this tetramer. So again with hemoglobin there's going to be four hemoglobin protomers so four hemes that are binding. So four oxygen molecules can bind to one hemoglobin molecule. We spent a lot of time on this slide kind of putting this big picture together that allowed us to act out our function of hemoglobin sort of in our room that was our cardiovascular system. So we kind of highlighted up at the front of the room when we had our lungs where we take in oxygen. We were reminded of the purpose of breathing, right? Breathing brings oxygen in, and exhale CO2 out. So again, we have a single cell thick here in our lungs in these alveoli, which allows for gases to diffuse from this high concentration in the air into a lower concentration that's going to be um, in our, in our uh, cardiovascular system there in our blood. And so when we have this diffusion, it's important to highlight that this is something that goes with its concentration gradient. So high concentrations in the air here, lower concentrations in the blood, so that's why oxygen is going to come out and diffuse across this layer. It's gonna encounter red blood cells in uh, your bloodstream that are filled with hemoglobin. You can really think of red blood cells as kind of bags of hemoglobin. And that hemoglobin that's within those red blood cells will bind that oxygen and the arteries will take it away and deliver it to the peripheral tissues. So within the peripheral tissues now, we're gonna have this oxygen that will diffuse away from our hemoglobin and uh, into the tissues where it's going to bind to myoglobin. So one of the things we'll get to in a little bit is to understand why myoglobin's able to pick it up and hemoglobin's able to let it go. So we'll get to that in a few minutes. But again, that oxygen is going to be delivered to the cells which are actively undergoing fuel metabolism and we're going to be generating that CO2. I'm going to return in a minute to the blue part here that talks about how carbonic anhydrase comes into play here. But at the end of the day we're going to have this deoxygenated hemoglobin returning via the veins to the lungs to continue this process. So one of the things I want to expand on now is to highlight how carbonic anhydrase facilitates this process with the elimination of CO2. So remember, this is the equation that we learned when we first studied carbonic anhydrase. Carbon dioxide plus water generates bicarbonate and protons. Now I've simplified this a little bit. We used to have two parts to this equation to remind us of the pKa for carbonic anhydrase. But this is going to be sufficient for our understanding here. So we take a gaseous product, which you never want to have gas bubbles in our cardiovascular system. This enzyme converts it into the soluble bicarbonate, which is put into the bloodstream and then makes its way back to the lungs. Now what's really important with carbonic anhydrase here is this equilibrium becomes reversed once we get up into the lungs. So now we're gonna take that bicarbonate, we're gonna combine it with protons, and then we're gonna generate CO2, which can then be exhaled. So we went through and we acted out this whole sort of song and dance when we did our hemoglobin highway, but we began our understanding by looking at this static picture. Another really important aspect to think about with hemoglobin function is the conformation that hemoglobin is in really has a lot to do with whether or not it can perform its function, which in this case is to bind oxygen. So one of the things that we talked about is conformational changes or shape changes alter between T state and R state. So those are two letters that you wanna know. If we're in the R state, that means we're in a conformation that's competent to bind our ligand. So in that case, we generate oxyhemoglobin. So our state hemoglobin is really oxyhemoglobin because it's in a conformation that's conducive to binding oxygen. And we liken this to thinking about a Rubik's cube that you might sort of kind of toggle back and forth between, um, you know, being all, all four sides are kind of equal and then you kind of turn it maybe a half of a turn. That's kind of what you want to think about between going between oxyhemoglobin and deoxyhemoglobin. So again, deoxyhemoglobin is going to be what we refer to as T state. There's no ligand bound. T state again means we are in a shape, a conformation that's not conducive to binding ligand. So again, this T state and R state is gonna become a really important component in kind of us understanding lots of other protein function. This isn't specific to hemoglobin, but it's easy to think about it with hemoglobin because there's really not catalytic function or anything else going on with hemoglobin. It's really just binding and then letting go of a ligand.
We then moved on to think about how a binding curve might look different when we have something like hemoglobin, which participates in cooperative binding. When we have cooperative binding, our binding curve is going to have a different shape. It's going to be sigmoidal. So we can see that sigmoidal shape right here for, for uh, hemoglobin, and we can see how it looks different from the hyperbolic binding that we saw for myoglobin. And a hallmark of cooperative binding is what happens is that the first binding event affects the others. This is sort of an all or nothing thing. Remember with hemoglobin that we have four protomers, four individual hemoglobin subunits that associate to make that tetramer. So when the first one kind of goes from that T state, which is not conducive to binding oxygen, to R state and then binds oxygen, it automatically forces the other, four, other three subunits to also change to R state, even though they haven't yet bound oxygen. And what that does is it puts them in the R state, which automatically increases their affinity for oxygen. So they're able to bind it that much more easily. Now we didn't get into a lot of the details with what this might look like when we look at, for example, a hill plot and so forth. But again, it suffice to say that when you have cooperative binding, the first binding effect is gonna affect the others. And in the case of hemoglobin binding to oxygen, it makes each subsequent binding event that much easier. So some numbers that are really important that I want you to know here, there's four numbers that I want you to know. I want you to know what the P50 and for myoglobin and for hemoglobin are. So again, hemoglobin is 26 tor, myoglobin is 2.8 tor. I want you to know kind of what the concentration of oxygen is under venous conditions versus arterial conditions. So it's about 30 tor for venous pressure, about 100 tor for arterial pressure. And just like we talked about with pKa and pH, we need to compare these two numbers to determine whether or not our ligand is going to be bound. So when the concentration of our ligand is greater than the concentration that we need to be half bound, we say that we are bound to our ligand. So kind of this relationship between an, uh, an environmental property and a molecular property are kind of important to determine whether or not we've got um, uh, binding happening. And I didn't mention this when we looked at the hyperbolic binding curve, but the, the shape of these curves should inherently make sense that as we increase the concentration of our ligand, we should increase the fraction of our molecule that's bound to our ligand. That's what YO2 is, fractional saturation. So right, that makes sense. If we have more ligand, we should have more of our substance that's bound to its ligand. So one of the things that we spent a good bit of time sort of talking about here, and I know it's a little bit hard to see here in the green color, but we talked about these two differences. This A difference here is the difference between this point right here and this guy. So in the A point, we're looking at the same protein. We're looking at hemoglobin because we're on the hemoglobin line here. And we're asking what happens as we change the environment. That is, we go from arterial pressure down to venous pressure. So the difference between these two represents the um, kind of loading and unloading of oxygen to hemoglobin. When we're under high oxygen concentration, we're going to be close to fully loaded. As we go towards venous oxygen concentrations, lower oxygen concentrations, our fractional saturation is going to be less such that we're unloading more. And again, we can use this PO2 compared to P50 comparison to kind of rationalize that. The second situation that we looked at was comparing sort of this B range here. And in this case, we're looking at the same environment. In this case, venous pressure. And we're asking what happens if we change the protein? So as we look at the differences between, in this case, hemoglobin and myoglobin here, the differences in where they want to be saturated are such that this represents the transfer of oxygen from hemoglobin to myoglobin. Hemoglobin really only wants to be about 50% saturated. Myoglobin is close to being fully saturated, so myoglobin is more than happy to take the oxygen that hemoglobin wants to give up. And the idea is, if we think back to our bucket brigade, this would be pretty inefficient here if we really only dumped our water buckets halfway empty. So the question is, is how do we think about lowering this point? How do we think about dumping our bucket out so that we are more efficient in our delivery of oxygen? We also spent a good bit of time on this slide. This slide's very busy, so I'll try to walk you back through it because there were some equations that we had already learned in previous learning units and we're putting together with some new equations. So let's first talk about this new equation that we have here. 
We call this the Perutz model equation. So this is an equation that I generated to kind of help us think about what the R state versus T state conformation is of our hemoglobin, whether it's bound to oxygen or not bound to oxygen, and what the protonation state is. So why this equation is helpful is it reminds us that there's sort of this mutual exclusivity of binding oxygen and protons. And I have to highlight again, this is not implying that they're binding to the same site. This is not that they're competing for the same area of binding on the protein, but it helps remind us that if we are not bound to oxygen, we are bound to protons. And so hemoglobin is protonated in its T state and deoxy. Once we bind oxygen, it becomes in its R state and deprotonated. So understanding that protonation state is gonna become really important as we understand how different metabolic processes affect that protonation state. I'm gonna jump down here to our main sort of carbonic anhydrase equation here. And again, remember the carbonic anhydrase equation is important because CO2 that's generated as waste product needs to be converted into a soluble form here and then reconverted into CO2 so that we can exhale it. So again, returning to breathing here, purpose of breathing again is to eliminate CO2 waste and then to bring O2 in. So again, if we bring O2 in, that O2 is going to bind to hemoglobin. We're gonna generate oxyhemoglobin. And then this oxyhemoglobin is gonna come over here to our respiring tissues and be used in our fuel equation. So again, that fuel equation is going to combust or metabolize that fuel in the presence of oxygen generating CO2 waste and generating that energy. So remember, we've learned that energy is ATP. So sort of a new equation that we're gonna think about in a different context here. We've talked about the ATP hydrolysis equation. The hydrolysis of ATP to generate ADP and PI, we've learned is worth 30.5 kilojoules per mole. One of the things that we didn't talk about was the fact that that process generates a good amount of protons. And so when those protons are generated, those protons can feed back into this equilibrium. And if we increase the concentration of protons, meaning we decrease the pH, this equilibrium will shift to the left here, meaning we are going to shift to T state hemoglobin and release more oxygen to go to our respiring tissues. So this is sort of a feedback system. This is called the Bohr effect, such that any process that induces metabolic acidosis will increase the delivery of oxygen. So again, a feedback system of when we are doing a lot of fuel consumption, when we're doing a lot of exercise, the drop in pH, again, this is metabolic acidosis, will facilitate the release of more oxygen to allow us to continue this process. So a lot going on in this slide, uh, but again, important pieces to put all together. So again, the Bohr effect here, we can highlight with this binding equation or this binding curve that shows us again, as we go from left to right here, we decrease our pH, we become more acidic and our binding curve shifts to the right. So a really important concept to take from this chapter is when a binding curve shifts to the right, we are going to bind ligands more loosely. So again, said another way, when we bind this ligand more loosely, oxygen more loosely, we are releasing more oxygen to our tissues to be able to do the chemistry that needs to happen. So the Bohr effect is a drop in blood pH will favor T state or deoxyhemoglobin, which will allow us to deliver more oxygen to our respiring tissues. Now we spent a good bit of time sort of talking about and then acting out our hemoglobin highway. So I'm not gonna to spend too much time kind of going through it here, but remember the players that we had is we had four individuals that were going to be uh, hemoglobin. They were all stuck together. They all had to be either T state or R state in the same situation. We had myoglobin that kind of was able to sit back in the tissues and not really move around. And we had carbon, uh, carbonic anhydrase that did the chemistry between uh, carbon dioxide and water and then converting it to protons and bicarbonate. We talked about how we could change our environment, right? The concentration of oxygen could be different depending on when, whether we were in the lungs or the tissues. And then we kind of role played what would happen if you were in a high altitude environment. We also sort of mapped on how a molecule like 2,3-BPG could affect things. 
So again, one of the things we see here, stripped hemoglobin actually binds oxygen uh, the most tightly. And we can see as we put things like BPG or CO2 in, all of those allow oxygen to be bound less tightly to hemoglobin, meaning it's released to a greater extent to the environment. So again, a binding curve that shifts right indicates we're binding ligands more loosely. So again, binding BPG and chemistry that happens with carbon dioxide favors the T state. So deoxygenated hemoglobin, meaning we're delivering that oxygen to our tissues. So again, this is just sort of a, 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 a covalent bind or non-covalent binding. If you want to think about it, BPG has you know, functional groups and shape that allow it to sort of bind to that Rubik's cube when it's in its T state, and it sort of locks it in that shape. Similarly, when we think about the chemistry that happens, for example, with this uh, formation of a carbamate, this is a carbamate, we've got carbon dioxide here, we've got the N terminus that we see in a hemoglobin protomer. And what happens is we actually carboxylate this N terminus, and what that does is it changes the positively charged N terminus, once we do this chemistry, to a negative charge. And you have to imagine that changing what was a positive charge in a region of a protein to a negative charge might alter the shape or the conformation that protein wants to be in. So again, carbon dioxide chemistry also allows us to change the shape, favor the T state, and then get oxygen to dump, or get hemoglobin to dump more oxygen to the respiring tissues. So again, this is another one of those feedback systems where when we're generating a lot of carbon dioxide, I'm going to flip back here for a second, generating a lot of carbon dioxide means we're doing a lot of fuel consumption. So again, generating a lot of protons means we're using a lot of the ATP, generating a lot, generating a lot of the CO2 also generates more protons, but CO2 can also help in a third way here where we're going to have it do some chemistry with the N termini of uh, these hemoglobin protomers and generate these carbamates, which help to change the shape of the protein. We talked a little bit about high altitude adaptation. You can see here when we have high altitude um, adaptation. So again, we've got this red line here, sort of represents um, what, what happens in a long-term sense with your body. But we look at the black line here to start. We can see that if we are at high altitude, what this means is we don't fill our bucket up as much because we can't go to these high concentrations of oxygen. So we don't fill up our bucket as much, and so when we dump it, we have only about a 30% dumping, where if we were fully filling up our bucket and kind of going to the same arterial or venous pressure, we would be dumping close to 40%. So again, as a way to think about what we do, what happens when you train at high altitude, so this is more of a long-term fix. High altitude in the short term means you're not going to deliver as much oxygen. You're going to feel really tired and winded if you're exercising at high altitude. What begins to happen, though, after a few days of exercising in those environments is your body is going to increase the synthesis of that BPG. Remember, what BPG does is it's going to shift this point down. It's going to favor more of that hemoglobin dumping its oxygen. And so what we have here in this blue region is we have an increased unloading of oxygen. Now, you do have in this green area here a, a, a decreased efficiency for loading because you're still at conditions that are low in terms of its oxygen concentration. But at the end of the day, this is a greater um, help in terms of the increase in unloading than is uh, with the problem in, in loading here. As you can see here, we get back to almost the same sort of um, efficiency of transfer, about 37% versus 38%. So that's how high al altitude adaptation works. The last thing that we talked about in this chapter was sickle cell anemia. So here's some important things that I want you to know with sickle cell anemia. I want you to know the mutation that occurs with sickle cell anemia. It's a glutamic acid, which is negatively charged, mutated to a nonpolar valine. So here's why this is important. R state hemoglobin, there's no problem. When you're in the R state, no problem. When you have T state kind of change in shape, what happens is you actually expose this little greasy knob, if you will. And so in the blue here, we have one hemoglobin protomer on one hemoglobin tetramer. And then you have an adjacent area on another hemoglobin uh, tetramer. 
that has a perfectly shaped binding pocket to fit that. So you sort of have this knob and groove sort of situation that's available, but it's really only present when you're in T state. So again, when you're in T state, you can have these hemoglobins that will polymerize. And when they polymerize into these long filaments, they change the shape of your red blood cell from this nice biconcave disc to this very sickle shape. And this creates what we call vasoocclusion. In your vascular system, you are going to be blocking. And so you have this situation. And the problem is when you're out all the way here in the, the uh, distal uh, capillaries in your venous system, not only uh, are they very small, so they're much more prone to this blockage happening, but if we were able to have oxygen around, then we could return these T-state hemoglobins back to their R state. We sort of break apart this because once we go back to R state, now this knobs and grooves is no longer accessible. And so we can get back here. So one of the potential questions for your take home exam is thinking about how this situation might be compromised at high altitude how it might be compromised at high altitude for somebody who's doing exercise where they're sort of um, decreasing their, their blood pH. So we'll kind of expand on that a little bit in some take home questions. Some take home questions might also kind of think about something we didn't talk about in class, except very briefly is to say that, you know, for something like sickle cell anemia, which is a disease, there seems to be a natural selection for it. And the natural selection occurs in re regions that are endemic for malaria. So there seems to be an, a, a protection that's afforded by sickle cell carriers in regions where malaria is prevalent. So a potential take home question is to expand on this a little bit further and think about how that might come into play.